In the latest episode of our podcast, Into the Killing, we talk about a brutal murder that happened in 1989. It wasn't long before the police had a suspect. It was a man with a disturbing past, but they didn't have enough evidence to charge him. It would take some amazing forensic work to finally bring him to justice. You can find Into the Killing on Spotify, Amazon Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But before we start today's video, we're just going to take a few moments to talk about our wonderful sponsor, Magellan TV. I've been watching Magellan TV for a long time now, and I hope you have too. The other day, I watched one of Magellan TV's new releases called We Are Legend. It's a great series that details the history of three pop culture icons, Dracula, Tarzan, and the world's greatest detective, Sherlock Holmes. It's a fascinating three-part series that follows these characters from their early days in literature all the way to contemporary times. To me, it's amazing that for over a century, these characters still connect with people and have a massive audience. I personally really enjoyed the Sherlock Holmes episode, and I think you will too if you're a fan of true crime and mysteries. We Are Legend is just one of Magellan TV's new releases. Every week, they add 15 to 20 hours of new content so true crime fans will never run out of something to watch. This is in addition to the library of over 3,000 documentaries that they already have. Magellan TV has an amazing offer for criminally listed viewers. Sign up right now and you'll get a month for free. Just go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed to get the free month so you can check out We Are Legends plus a bunch of great true crime documentaries. Please check out Magellan TV today because you'll be supporting Criminally Listed and you'll find something great to watch. Number 3. Christopher Wade Lee Charlie Porter was born three days after Christmas in Pueblo, Colorado. In late spring 2014, 19-year-old Lee was dating a young man, Jesse Mine, but she was upset that he was moving out of state. On June 3rd, 2014, Lee traveled to Westminster, Colorado to hang out with a male friend she knew from high school. A few days later, Lee's brother, Max Porter, called their mother, Renee Jackson. He was panicking because he couldn't get a hold of Lee. Renee figured out that the friend Lee went to see in Westminster was 23-year-old Christopher Wade. Wade was studying criminal justice in college and he wanted to be a police officer. He was a straight-A student and he was described as a teacher's pet. He had been in the army, but he was discharged after he told a psychiatrist they had fantasies about breaking into homes and raping and murdering women. Wade told Renee that Lee had come to his apartment, but she didn't stay long. She got a message on her phone and then she left his apartment. The last time he saw her, she was getting into a white truck. Lee's family reported her missing on June 5th, 2014. Her car was found abandoned in the parking lot of Wade's apartment building. It did not contain any clues as to her whereabouts. The police interviewed Christopher Wade, who was the last person to see her. Wade told the police that he found some heroin in Lee's possession, so he confronted her. He said that they argued, she made a phone call, and then she left the apartment. What the police found odd was after she supposedly left Wade's apartment, she hadn't used her credit cards or phone, and she had not accessed her social media accounts. The police strongly believed that Wade had something to do with Lee's disappearance, but they could not prove anything. Lee's brother Max and her boyfriend, Jesse, also thought that Wade had something to do with her disappearance. On June 12, 2014, Max and Jesse traveled to Westminster and convinced Wade to come with them to a park not far from his apartment. At the park, Wade confessed to killing Lee. Afterward, Max punched Wade in the face. Then they forced Wade to call 911 and he confessed to the operator. After the call, the police arrested Wade. In custody, Wade told the detectives that he and Lee had consensual sex. Then they got into an argument and she attacked him with a knife. He claimed that he started choking her in self-defense and he ended up killing her. 
He stuffed her body into a duffel bag and then he placed her body in a dumpster. He threw her wallet, purse, phone, and clothes into different dumpsters in the area. The police believed Wade when he said that he killed her and dumped her body. They just didn't think he was acting in self-defense. They asked him why he didn't try to wrestle the knife away or call the police or just leave the apartment. He could have done any number of things instead of killing her. Wade admitted that he should have done something else. Investigators believe that Lee's body ended up in the Allied Way Services Tower Road landfill. The landfill was searched for 45 days. Lee's clothes and cell phone were found, but her body wasn't located. The police asked Wade if he studied criminal justice to learn how to get away with murder. He said that he didn't, but he admitted that some things he learned in class helped him when it came to being questioned by the police. The police searched Wade's computer and they found some child pornography. So he was also charged with sexual exploitation of a child. While the police had a confession, they did not have a body. So the district attorney offered Wade a plea deal. He could plead guilty to second degree murder and sexual exploitation of a child and he would be sentenced to 48 years of prison. In September 2016, Christopher Wade took the plea deal. A month later, Wade was interviewed by ABC News. Wade said they planned on dying by suicide after he killed Lee. But he said that Lee's spirit came to him and convinced him not to kill himself. As for why he confessed, he explained they had deep fascination with tarot cards. He said that the tarot cards showed him that living with the guilt would destroy him, so he needed to confess. When Lee's brother and boyfriend confronted him, he knew it was his chance to unburden himself, so he confessed. At the time of this video, Christopher Wade is 30 years old and he is serving a sentence at the Lyman Correctional Facility in Lyman, Colorado. He will be eligible to apply for parole after 30 years. His first possible parole hearing is April 2048 when he will be 57 years old. Number 2. Dan Leach Pecan Grove is the census-designated area about 30 miles outside of Houston, Texas. In early 2004, it was home to 19-year-old Ashley Wilson. On January 19, 2004, Wilson's mother, Renee Coulter, went over to her daughter's apartment. Coulter had not been able to contact her daughter for several days. When Coulter got into the apartment, she was hit by an awful odor. She also heard the song Behind Blue Eyes by the rock band, The Who, playing. Coulter made her way to the bedroom and found something that mentally scarred her. It was her daughter's dead body hanging from a bedpost. It was clear that Ashley Wilson had been dead for several days. A pillowcase was over her head and the cord from her high school graduation gown was wrapped around her neck. The other end of the cord was tied to the bedpost. Coulter called the sheriff's department. The medical examiner determined that the cause of death was ligature strangulation. It appeared that Wilson had tied the cord to her neck and the other end to the bedpost. She then sat down and hanged herself. The sheriff's deputies discovered a signed, handwritten note that could be strewed as a suicide note. It said that Wilson thought she was pregnant, but the child's father didn't want to be with her and he would not help raise the child. The note did not outright say she planned on killing herself. While Wilson thought she might have been pregnant, the medical examiner determined she was not pregnant. Ultimately, Ashley Wilson's death was ruled a suicide. This ruling did not sit well with Wilson's parents. They thought that several things were strange about the apartment. For example, Wilson always kept her TV and ceiling fans on. But when her mother got into the apartment, they were all turned off. Also, the key to her apartment was missing. 
Finally, Wilson didn't have a history of mental illness or suicidal thoughts. The Sheriff's Department understood that suicide is tough for families to accept and sometimes they rationalize or explain things to make it look like their loved ones didn't take their own lives. So despite the oddities, they still consider the case closed. Now on March 9th, about seven weeks after the murder, something strange happened. A 21-year-old man named Dan Leach came into the sheriff's office and he had a disturbing story. He explained that he and Ashley Wilson knew each other in high school. After high school, he served in the Air Force. He was discharged in 2003. After he was discharged, he and Wilson became reacquainted. He claimed that he and Wilson had sex once. Afterwards, she told him she was pregnant. Leach said that he didn't want to be with Wilson because he thought she was immature. He also didn't want anything to do with the baby. Leach also explained that he and his family were very religious and he didn't want his family to know he had been intimate with Wilson. He absolutely didn't want them to know that he had gotten her pregnant out of wedlock. So he decided to murder her and to get away with it, he would make it look like a suicide. On January 15, 2004, he went over to Wilson's apartment. He told her if she wanted to feel better, she should write a list of things that were troubling her. She did, and this was the note the deputies found that they thought was a suicide note. Leach then told her that they were going to do a trust exercise by putting a pillowcase over her head. He told her that she was supposed to use all her senses other than sight. When she put the pillowcase over her head, he pulled out some gloves that he had hidden in the waistband of his pants and he put them on. He then got the cord and strangled her to death. Leach said they hung the body from the bedpost to make it look like a suicide. He wiped down the apartment to hide his fingerprints. Finally, he set behind blue eyes to play on repeat because he wanted the scene to be eerie for whoever found the body. Leach would have gone away with the murder had he not confessed because the case was considered closed. So why did he confess? Leach explained that he went and saw Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. He said that the movie made him very emotional and he felt terrible for not repenting. Leach also said he felt terrible for Wilson's parents. He did not want them thinking that they had failed her. He also didn't want someone in Wilson's family dying by suicide because they thought she had killed herself. Leach explained that after he saw the movie, he went to his church. At the end of the service, he spoke to the congregation. He explained they had done something horrible and he was going on a journey for a long time. He asked the congregation to pray for him. After Mass, Leach went to the home they shared with his parents. When he arrived home, his parents asked the preacher and church elders to come over. Leach then confessed to murdering Ashley Wilson. A few days later, he came into the sheriff's office. Leach told the detectives that God would hold him accountable for his actions if he didn't confess. In August 2004, Dan Leach pleaded guilty to murder. He was looking at a sentence of five years to life in prison. In a morbid way, Leach was lucky that Wilson was not pregnant. If she was pregnant, he could have been sentenced to death under the Prenatal Protection Act, which was passed in 2003. The prosecution wanted the jury to sentence Leach to life in prison. Leach's lawyer asked for 25 to 40 years in prison. Some jury members wanted him to get life in prison and others wanted a lesser sentence. They ended up compromising and he was sentenced to 75 years of prison. At the time of this video, 38-year-old Dan Leach is serving a sentence at the Darrington Unit in Rocheron, Texas. He'll be able to apply for parole in March 2034 when he's 51 years old. Number 1. Dorothy Marie Robards 
In February 1993, 38-year-old Steve Robards was living in Fort Worth, Texas with his 16-year-old daughter, Dorothy Robards, who went by her middle name, Marie. Steve and Marie's mother, Beth, were divorced. Marie had been living with her mother, but then her mother married a man named Frank, and Marie couldn't stand her stepfather. Steve worked as a mail carrier. Marie attended high school, and by all accounts, she was a good kid who never got into trouble. She did not date much, but the boys at her school found her attractive. On February 17, 1993, Steve and Marie had takeout food from a Mexican restaurant. After dinner, Steve went to an evening church service. When Steve returned home, he complained that he had a stomach ache. He then started vomiting. Marie went over to Steve's girlfriend's apartment and told her that her father was ill. Steve's girlfriend went to check on him, and when she did, she found that Steve was very ill. His limbs were becoming stiff, and he was foaming at the mouth. She called 911, and paramedics rushed to the apartment. Marie came back into the apartment shortly after the paramedics arrived. The paramedics tried to get a breathing tube into Steve's throat, but it had closed up. 38-year-old Steve Robards died before he could be taken out of his apartment. The medical examiner labeled the cause of death as cardiac arrest. The medical examiner knew it was unusual for someone Steve's age to have a fatal heart attack, but it turned out that Steve had an enlarged heart. After the funeral, Marie's mother, Beth, told her that she was having problems with her current husband, Frank. She had plans to leave him and move to Florida. She wanted Marie to move to Florida with her. Marie was shocked by the news, but she was happy to have a new life with her mother. Beth and Marie ended up moving to Panama City, Florida about six weeks after Steve's death. But a few weeks after that, Beth's estranged husband, Frank, showed up in Panama City and asked Beth to take him back. Beth agreed, and Frank moved in. At first, Marie was okay with her stepfather being there. But after a short time, she realized he was the same man she disliked. She also missed Texas. She contacted Steve's father, who lived in Mansfield, Texas, and asked if she could live with him and his wife. They agreed, and she moved in with them. At her new school, Marie was a straight-A student and played on the volleyball team. She became close friends with a young woman named Stacy High, who was one of the most popular girls in school. Marie and Stacy were in the same English class, and that year they were studying William Shakespeare's Hamlet. In the play, the King of Denmark is Claudius, who is the uncle of the titular character, Hamlet. In Act 3, Scene 3, Claudius confesses in a soliloquy to poisoning Hamlet's father so he could take over as king. Claudius is agonizing over repenting for the murder of his brother. Stacy and Marie were starting to play together, and Stacy read part of the soliloquy to Marie. My fault is past, but oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me, my foul murder? This cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. After hearing the segment of the soliloquy, Marie was visibly shaken. Marie asked Stacy if she thought someone could go through life without a conscience. Marie then started weeping. Stacy asked her what was wrong and Marie told her to guess. After a few questions, as a joke, Stacy asked her if she killed someone. Marie then admitted that she poisoned her father. Marie told Stacy that she had stolen some barium acetate from her chemistry classroom. A week later, she put the poison in her father's refried beans. After confessing, Marie begged Stacy not to tell anyone, and she agreed. Stacy's agreement to keep the secret weighed heavily on her conscience. She knew that if she told the police, her best friend could spend the rest of her life in prison. 
On the first anniversary of Steve's death, his father took Marie and Stacy out for dinner. He tried to make several toasts to his late son, and Marie cut him off each time. Over the next several weeks, Stacy kept having nightmares about Steve calling out to Marie from his grave. Finally, Stacy knew that she could no longer keep her secret. In March 1994, about eight months after Marie confessed to killing her father, Stacy went to the school counselor and had them call the police. Stacy then told the police that Marie had confessed to her. The police started an investigation, but it was slow moving. Meanwhile, Marie and Stacy continued on with their lives, and they both graduated. Stacy went to Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, and Marie went to the University of Texas at Austin. Marie was enrolled in pre-med. She wanted to become a pathologist. About eight months after Stacy gave her statements to the police regarding Marie's confession, the police got the results from the tests on Steve's blood and tissue samples. There was 250 times more than the standard amount of barium acetate in Steve's blood system. The reason it wasn't found in the initial autopsy is because a specialized machine is needed to detect rare chemicals like that. In 1994, the machine cost about $150,000, so not many medical examiner's offices had the machine. The medical examiner's office that did Steve's autopsy was one of the offices that did not have one. The investigators also paid a visit to Marie's old chemistry classroom. They looked at a safety manual and found out that the page for barium acetate had been torn out. In October 1994, Marie was questioned by the police. Nearly instantly, she confessed to killing her father. She told them that she put the poison in his refried beans. The investigators asked her why she did it, and she said it was because she loved and missed her mother. She thought that the only way she could have gone back to her mother was if her father was dead. Marie Robarts was arrested on October 18, 1994. Everyone who knew her was shocked by the arrest. Marie seemed like the ideal teenage girl that anyone would have wanted as their daughter. Her mother, Beth, was deeply saddened because when Marie poisoned her father, she had already made plans for them to move to Florida together. Beth wondered what would have happened if she told Marie about her plans a week earlier. Could they have saved Steve's life? When Marie was arrested, the prosecutor called it the perfect crime. He said that Marie would have gone away with it had Stacy not told the police that Marie had confessed to her. Marie went to trial in May 1996. She claimed that she had not intended to kill her father and she had only wanted to make him sick. The prosecutor said that if that were true, Marie could have told Steve's girlfriend or the paramedics what poison Steve had ingested and they could have possibly saved him. Marie's trial lasted three days. The jury deliberated for under an hour. She was found guilty of first-degree murder. The jury could have sentenced her anywhere from probation to life in prison. Once again, the jury deliberated for less than an hour. They sentenced her to 28 years of prison. But she only ended up serving seven years of prison. She was paroled in 2003 and is now living under a new name. Her current whereabouts are unknown. At the time of this video, Dorothy Marie Robards would be 43 or 44 years old. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Don't forget to check out the latest episode of Into the Killing. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.